Hello, I'm Lizzie, and welcome to this, the third of CADON's series of kit videos. In this video, I'm going to be looking at all the sound equipment that CADON provides its partners. Everything from this podcaster microphone to this audio recorder. During the course of the video, I'm also going to be touching upon some of the things you need to think about when you're recording your sound to get the best results. To help you navigate this video, we've added some chapter buttons. So if you want to review something or if you want to skip ahead, just click on some of the buttons here beside me. So let's take a look at the core equipment that we're going to cover. We'll start off by taking a look at what's probably our best microphone, the Rode NTG2, which is a directional mic, otherwise known as a shotgun. Then we're going to look at this lapel mic, the Rode Lavalier. Next, we'll take a look at the Rode VideoMic Pro, which is designed to work with a DSLR camera. Next up is the Zoom H2N, which is an all-in-one portable recording device with its own inbuilt microphones. Finally, we're going to talk about the Rode Podcaster, which is designed to record directly onto a computer. So let's get started with the NTG2. I'm just going to get everything else off the table. Now, this is a directional mic, also known as a shotgun. It's a good microphone to use with the JVC HM150, which I've got here. Shotgun mics are very sensitive and have what's called a supercardioid polar pattern. Polar patterns are a visual way of understanding which direction a mic is sensitive to. In other words, where it picks up sound and where it doesn't. As you can see from this diagram, supercardioid is a narrow focus pattern that targets sound directly in front of the microphone and rejects it from the side, just like a shotgun shooting in one focus direction. This is really useful because it means you can focus on specific sources of sound. The directional nature of shotguns make them the go-to mic for video production because they act just like a camera's lens pointing in one direction. Shotguns are also useful if you want to keep your microphone out of shot. One thing you have to remember with this mic is it can't be handheld. If you do touch it, you're going to get a nasty rustling sound like this. Now obviously this mic isn't plugged in, but that's the magic of editing. You want to avoid that kind of noise at all costs because it will ruin your recording. What you need to do to avoid handling noise is put the microphone on a mount. For instance, you could use an on-camera mount like this one on the JVC. And I'll just show you quickly how to do that. You put it in, close it up. Okay, there you go. Make sure it's nice and tight so that the microphone doesn't wobble around. Now you don't have to touch the mic and the little rubber pads inside the mount mean that it's not going to pick up any handling noise when you're operating the camera either. Once you've mounted your microphone, of course the next thing you have to do is connect it up to your camera. The NTG2, like most professional microphones, connects using an XLR cable and in this situation you're going to need an extra short one, like this one here. Now, you can always tell an XLR cable by these three pin plugs. And what you do is you take the female end and you stick it in to the end of your microphone. until it clicks into place. Then you take the other end and you put it in the XLR input on your camera. Just do that. There you go, you're all connected up. This setup is great if you're by yourself and you're having to move around a lot while you're shooting. It's going to give you a natural sound with an acceptable level of focus on your audio subject. However, you are limited by your shooting distance and you're not going to be able to get the mic closer in for a more focused sound recording. The other thing you can do is mount the microphone on a pistol grip, like this one. Now, a pistol grip does an even better job at isolating the microphone from handling noise thanks to this rubber suspension cradle, also known as a shock mount. Let me just show you how to put the microphone into the pistol grip. I'll take it out of here, unscrew. I'm going to take the cable off. You can't put it into the pistol grip with the cable attached. And um, it slides in like this, actually pretty hard to do. Just push it in, don't worry too much, there you go. Now, you can see why it's called a pistol grip, because it, it looks like a gun. Um, once the microphone's in, you can adjust this head using this locking lever here. I'll just undo it for you, there you go. I'm going to put it up, 
lock it down and make sure this little knob here is tight so that it doesn't wobble around. With this pistol grip, you can use the NTG2 as a handheld interview mic like this. You can also attach it to a boom pole, like the one I've got here. Using a boom pole allows you to get your shotgun closer to the source of your sound, and it also allows you to point it at a specific direction and change that direction responsively. So for instance, if you're recording two people talking, you can get your mic and point it to one person first and then the next person, picking up both voices clearly. A boom pole certainly adds production value, but you do need an extra person on your crew to operate it. A boom operator is very useful because they also often act as a sound man, taking care of every aspect of your sound recording, like monitoring and levels. This is great because it allows your cameraman to focus only on the visuals. But using a boom pole isn't as easy as it looks, so I'm just going to talk a bit more about it. To attach the pistol grip to the boom pole, what you need to do is attach the end of the grip, here you can see the screw, um, to the end of the pole. So, let's do that. Make sure it's as tight as possible. When you've got it attached, you can extend the pole by loosening um, these rings here, extending it out. Then, when you've got it the length you want, you tighten it up, grip there, loosen it. It can be a bit tricky and just fiddle around and you'll get it in the end. Once you've extended your boom pole out to the length that you want it, which will probably be longer than this, you can attach your mic to your recording device using a long XLR cable. I'd recommend something between 5 and 10 meters. I've got one here, so let's just show you what to do. This is 10 meters, which is quite long. So let's attach the end. Now, cables are a sound man's nightmare. And here's a good tip. What you should do is put the cable around the boom pole like this and then hold it taut and that's going to stop it flapping against the boom pole um, which your mic is going to pick up. Okay, so let me show you how to hold a boom pole. They're normally held high above your head like that, although down below is also a viable option. I'm not going to hold it too high because you won't be able to see what I'm doing. Hold the foam part of the pole and have your hands facing outwards like this, your palms facing outwards. And what you do is you rest the pole here in your leading hand between the thumb and the forefinger. That way you can easily turn the mic if you need to change the direction it's pointing using your hand here at the base of the pole. And this hand is also gripping the wire. I'm just gonna move along so that you can see what's happening at the mic end. Now, when you're using a boom pole, or even when you're just holding this pistol grip during an interview situation, you have to be really careful that your microphone doesn't appear in shot. You should also be aware of any shadows cast by your microphone or your boom pole. Making sure your microphone is out of shot is especially difficult if you're using a big fluffy windshield like this one. The NTG2 does come with its own foam shield, which I've got here. I'd recommend you use this when you're shooting indoors, but when you go outdoors, always change to this one. And this is why. This is sound recorded outside in moderate wind using the foam shield. And this is sound recorded using the fluffy windshield. Now, I'm just going to show you how to put them on. It just slips over the microphone like that. It's really easy. Pull it off, put the foam one on. There you go. No trouble at all. Now, this fluffy windshield can be used on the microphone when it's mounted on your camera. But you do have to be careful that it doesn't appear in shot, which means you might have to zoom in a tad to avoid it. If you don't have a boom operator, you could also use a mic stand or a light stand as an alternative. Of course, uh, a stand is only useful if you don't have to move around. So let's get rid of our boom pole.
and bring in a stand. This is a mic stand. Now, mic stands and light stands have different screw attachment sizes. Um, light stands actually usually have the same size screw attachment as the Rode boom pole, um, which means you can carry on using your pistol grip if you want to. Microphone stands, especially tall floor stands like this one, actually have bigger threads, so you're not going to be able to use the pistol grip. Instead, you're going to have to use another type of mount, like this one. Now, this is a simple plastic microphone mount that actually comes with the NTG2, and it fastens on quite easily to the end of the stand like this. Right, I'm going to tighten it up. There we go. Now, it can be quite difficult to get the microphone into one of these mounts, but if you angle it like this and push down, it does clip into place. If you're leaving your mic on a stand like this, you have to be careful it doesn't accidentally get knocked over. So put a sandbag or a similar kind of weight on the base of the stand. Those were a few ways of handling the NTG2. Before we move on, there are a few other important things you need to know about the mic. Firstly, it's a condenser microphone, which means it needs to be powered. In general, this power is going to come from your recording device via the XLR cable, and it's something that's called phantom power. To use phantom power, you need to make sure that your device is set to send power to the microphone. On the JVC, what you have to do is make sure that this switch here is set to mic plus 48 volts. So I'll do it here on input 2, and I'm only doing it on input 2 because I'm plugged in to input 2 here. I'll just do that to the camera. There you go. Switch it down to mic plus 48 volts and you're sending power to your mic. Alternatively, the NTG2 can run on battery power. What you need is a 1.5 volt A battery, just a normal battery like this, and it fits into this compartment at the end of the microphone. There it is. Unscrew it, pop the battery in, screw it back up, and there you go, you don't need phantom power now from your recording device. Finally, the NTG2 has a switchable high-pass filter, which you can use when you want to get rid of low-frequency sounds, such as traffic or air conditioning. I'll show you where it is. There it is. Now, to turn it on, what you need is a small screwdriver or a pen. So I'll show you how to do it. Stick the pen in there and switch it up. It's really easy to do. The filter works by blocking sound frequencies below 80 Hz and letting higher frequency sounds pass through. It can affect the tonal characteristics of your audio though, so I'd be very careful about using it. Do a few test recordings before you start to make sure. So that was the Rode NTG2 shotgun microphone. Let's move on now to the Rode lavalier. I'm just going to get everything off the table and bring on the Rode lavalier. As you can see, it comes in this uh, useful box and this is the microphone. Lavaliers are also known as lavs, lapel mics or clip-on mics. They're designed to be used during interviews or dialogue scenes. As you can see, they're really small microphones and with this clip, they can easily be attached to a person's clothing, like the one I've got here. This gives you great quality audio because it's right next to the source of your sound, which in this case is my voice. The Rode Lav has an omnidirectional polar pattern. As you can see from this diagram, that means it picks up sound from all directions. As such, you don't have to worry too much about which direction your microphone is pointing, or about things like slight head movements that might change where your sound is coming from. You do have to worry about getting the mic as close as possible to the source of your sound, however, otherwise you're going to pick up a lot of background noise. Setting up and using a lav is fairly easy. When you first get your Rode lav, you may find that it's separated out into different parts. So I'm just going to take it apart here to show you how to assemble it. What you'll get is this mic-on cable. Then you've got the microphone head, which is tiny, so be really careful you don't lose it or drop it. Then you've got uh, the microphone clip, and you've got two different connectors to connect to different recording devices. Finally, you've got these two different microphone shields or covers. What you do is you take this mic on cable and attach the head to it. You can attach it to either end of the cable, so that's quite easy. 
you screw it on gently like that. Then you need to choose your adapter. In this case, I'm going to go with the XLR adapter because I want to plug the lav into the JVC. Screw it on like that. It's pretty heavy, so you have to be careful. There we go. Now, if I was going to use the lav with the Zoom audio recorder, I'd be using this connector instead, which is a mini jack connector. The connections on the micron cable are quite delicate, so you do need to be careful. Make sure that the microphone and the connector are screwed on firmly though, because if you have a loose connection, you're going to get interference, which is going to ruin your recording. To attach the clip, what you do is you hold it between two fingers, and then you press down on this wire loop, and you stick the microphone head through the loop, and you let go. Um, now, the microphone has these little grooves on its body, and that's where the wire should go, and it should hold pretty firmly in place like that. With the clip on this side, the microphone is going to attach to this side of my clothing, to this side of my body. To have it on the other side, what you need to do is take it off, turn it upside down, and put it on again, and there you go, it's going to attach to this side of my body. Finally, you've got these two microphone shields. Um, this one here is called a pop filter, and I'd recommend you use it at all times when you're recording indoors. It helps prevent the popping sound you get when you say P's and T's. This furry one here is called a mini furry, and it's for use outdoors to prevent wind noise. Both of them fit very snugly onto the microphone, and what you do is you just push them on like that. You see? And take it off. Be very careful when you're doing that with the pop filter because it is quite delicate. I'll just show you what this looks like. It's quite obvious, it does make the microphone more obvious, but um, you do have to prevent wind noise. So, now you've got your microphone set up, you're ready to attach it to your subject. Where you position your mic is actually really important. The best position is in the centre of the chest, about six to eight inches below your subject's chin. You don't want to get it too high, because you'll find that the sound is blocked by the subject's chin, and it's easier to pick up unwanted noises like breathing. The clothing your subject is wearing will often dictate exactly where you clip the mic on. In between buttons on a shirt or the edge of a jacket like this is going to work really well. Now you need to make sure that the mic isn't going to be rubbing against anything. That's why it's attached to the outside of your clothing like this one. And that's also why the microphone is lifted a little bit above the clip. Wherever you position your mic, you need to do a sound test before you start recording to make sure you're getting a signal that is as strong and clear as possible. If you hear any unwanted noises, you need to take action to eliminate them. For instance, if you're getting rustling from your subject's clothing, you may have to ask them to change it. And if the hair of your subject is brushing against the top of the mic, you're going to have to put the hair up. More importantly than anything, you need to make sure that your subject knows not to touch or move the microphone during the recording. Once you've attached the microphone, you need to make sure that you do everything you can to hide the cable. You could, for instance, thread it inside the shirt or tape it to the inside of the jacket. Um, a visible cable really does look quite bad, so do what you can to hide it. Now there's just one more thing I need to cover about using the lavalier, and that's how to connect it up to your recording device. In this case, my recording device is the JVC, which I've got here. Let's tidy everything else up. Now, to connect the mic up to the JVC, you need an XLR cable. And I've got one here. So, you take the female end of the XLR cable, and you plug it in to the connector here. Then, you can make use of this very useful clip, and place these connectors, these plugs, um, out of sight by clipping it onto the belt of your subject or maybe onto the back pocket. Then you can take the other end of the XLR cable and plug it in to your JVC. I'm using input one here. I'll show you to the camera. There you go. Now, with this setup, obviously, you've got a cable that's running between your camera and your subject. So it's um, more suited to things like sit-down interviews and stationary pieces to camera. Do be careful, of course, that no one is going to trip over the cable. Unlike the shotgun mic, this lavalier does not need to be powered. So you need to go back to the input switches here on the JVC, and you need to make sure that 
input one, which is where I'm plugged in, is turned to mic rather than mic plus 48 volts. So let's just do that. There you go. That means that the camera is not going to send any power to the microphone. As I've already mentioned, you can also use the lav in conjunction with a Zoom audio recorder. All you need to do is change its connector. So let's unplug it, take it off, gently, and we're going to put on this mini jack. Let's get rid of all this and bring on the zoom. Now, the mini jack connects up to the zoom here where it says line in. Let's plug it in. Using the lav together with the zoom makes you effectively wireless because you're recording onto the zoom and you can put it in your pocket and walk around with it. Um, this gives you a lot more mobility and you can do things like allow your subject to walk down the street while delivering a piece to camera. It also allows you to be more creative in how you use the microphone. Although not ideal, it doesn't have to be just used as a clip-on interview mic. It could also be used in other ways. For instance, you could put it on a table and record a conversation between two or more people. Or you could hide it in the scenery just to record more general sound. However, do bear in mind that when you're recording onto the Zoom, you're going to have to sync your audio up with the visuals when you're editing, which does add another layer of work. I'm going to talk more about the Zoom and how you use it later on in this video. If you want to skip through to that section now, you can use the button beside me. Both the mics I've just covered, the NTG2 shotgun and the lavalier, are quite versatile in their uses. Now I'm going to look at a mic that has a more specific use, the Rode VideoMic Pro. Now this mic is designed to be used with a DSLR camera like this one, the 700D. DSLRs are mainly for taking photos. Video is really only just an add-on. Although you can get some lovely footage out of them, recording good audio is more problematic. They do have their own inbuilt microphones, and you can see this is the microphone here on 700D. It's very small. Um, the quality of these microphones is, is very low, and they're really more for reference than anything else. The VideoMic Pro aims to overcome this limitation, at least to some degree. The audio it captures isn't as good as the NTG2, for instance, but this mic more than makes up for its relative lack in quality by being super convenient and easy to use. Indeed, in auto mode, all you really need to do is attach it to the camera, plug it in and turn it on. And there you go, all of a sudden, the audio capabilities of your DSLR camera have jumped a hundredfold without much in the way of additional gear burden. So it's a solid fallback if you can't manage the hassle of recording your audio onto a separate device, which is what you really have to do if you want to get good quality sound shooting on this kind of camera. Like the NTG2, the VideoMic Pro is a shotgun mic with a narrow supercardioid polar pattern which targets sounds directly in front. This is one of the reasons it captures such good audio, because it focuses on the sound that you want and rejects noise from the surrounding environment. It's also a condenser mic, which means it needs to be powered. Now, DSLRs don't supply phantom power, so this mic powers itself using a 9-volt battery. The battery fits in here, and it can be really difficult to remove this cover and get it out, so don't do it unless you really need to. And you won't need to often, because it gives you about 70 hours of operating time. The mic comes cradled in its own integrated shock mount, which is another reason it can capture such good audio, because you're not going to get handling noises from operating the camera. At the base of the mount, you can see there's an attachment for the hot shoe on the top of your DSLR camera, and that's in general where it's put. There's also a thread here for attaching to a boom pole or a stand, but to do that, what you'd need to do is extend this existing cable with another audio cable, which isn't supplied. To attach the mic to the camera, all you need to do is slip it in to the hot shoe here, then tighten up this ring so it's secure. Then you need to attach the audio cable. Now, you attach it here, and it says mic on the flap, so it's pretty easy to find. You open it up, if you can, and then you plug it in. There you go, all nicely attached now. Now you have to turn the microphone on, which you do at the back here, using this top switch. Now be careful when you're pushing the switch over, not to push it all the way, but only push it into the middle where you can see the straight line. That's the on position. 
and when you push it over you can see the green light turns on. If you're going to push it all the way to the other side where you can see that angled line, what you're doing is activating the mic's high pass filter, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. Forgetting to turn this microphone on is a really common mistake. I know I've done it a few times myself. It's very frustrating because when you do that, you don't get any audio at all, not even from the camera's inbuilt microphone, because that's automatically disabled when the video mic is plugged in. Just try to make a habit of keeping a lookout for the green light on the back of the microphone. The high pass filter I just mentioned works in the same way as the filter on the NTG2. It cuts out low frequency sounds below 80 hertz, such as the rumble of traffic in the distance. Again, be very careful about using the filter because it can make your audio sound funny, so do a few tests before you decide to use it. Below this switch there's another switch which acts to either boost or reduce the audio signal that the microphone is sending to the camera. At the moment it's on 0 dB or 0 decibels and that's basically the off position. If I were to switch it down to minus 10 decibels, what I'd be doing is sending a weaker signal to the camera. And that's especially useful when you're recording in very loud environments such as a live music venue. Then you've got this plus 20 decibel setting, which sends a stronger signal to the camera. This is useful not only when you want to boost volume, it also helps reduce the hiss that you commonly get when recording audio on a DSLR. This trick only works when you're setting your audio levels manually inside the camera. With a stronger signal, you can turn your audio levels down. And this, of course, also reduces the background hiss, which is caused by the poor audio circuitry inside the camera. Unfortunately, if you're recording in auto, which you often have to do with a DSLR, there's nothing much you can do about the hiss. Although I'd always recommend you set your audio levels manually, that's often impractical to do on a DSLR, and that's because you can't actually monitor your sound. There's nowhere to plug in earphones, which is obviously a major drawback. Without earphones, it's no surprise that forgetting to turn the microphone on is such a common mistake. Another big problem is things like wind noise. You can't tell when there's something going wrong with your audio. Now this foam shield here can't be taken off. Rode does make a big fluffy windshield that fits over it. It's called a dead cat. I'd recommend that if you can get hold of one of those, you always use it when you're shooting outdoors. Without the ability to monitor your sound, your best option if you're out and about shooting, especially if you're changing locations, is to leave the camera's audio levels set to auto. If your shoot is relatively controlled, for instance, if you're filming an interview inside or if you're in a classroom and the level of noise is relatively constant, I'd say do have a go at setting the audio levels manually. To make sure your audio is going to be okay, do a few test clips before you start, then listen to them back on a computer. You don't want to use the camera to listen to what you've recorded because the playback speaker, which is back here, is very poor quality. So that's the VideoMic Pro. But what if you're shooting on a DSLR and you want to get really good quality audio? Well, you need to record onto an external device, like this one. The Zoom H2n. Now, when you're recording onto something like this, your visuals and your audio are going to be separate, and you're going to have to put them together while you're editing. With this kind of dual setup, you do have to remember to record some kind of audio on the DSLR as well. If you don't do that, you're not going to have a reference track, which means that syncing the two together is going to be really troublesome. I've already talked a little bit about the zoom, but I want to go into it in more depth now. So let's just get rid of the DSLR. The Zoom is a compact and versatile piece of equipment that allows you to record high quality audio in a variety of different scenarios. Not only does it let you connect up to an external microphone, it also has its own microphones, five capsules in all in fact behind this mesh, and that gives you four different record modes. It's very easy to use, but it does have a lot of features. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of them in this video, but I will cover the basics to get you up and running. The Zoom runs on 1.5 volt AA batteries, which you can access by opening the back like this. There they are. Now you can use either alkaline or nickel metal hydride batteries, but be sure to set which battery you're going to be using in the settings menu, otherwise you won't get an accurate reading of how much power you have left. By default the Zoom is set to alkaline. 
Now, these batteries are going to give you about 20 hours of operating time, which is actually really good. The Zoom records onto an SD card, which fits into a slot here at the base of the machine. You uh, pick open the flap here like that, and there's the SD card. Push it in, uh, and it pops out like that. And if you want to put it back in, you put it in like that, push it into place, and it clicks into place. I'll just do that to the camera. And go. Push it in to get it out, pops out, and then push it back in and it clicks into place. The Zoom can take normal SD cards with a capacity up to 2 gigabytes, as well as high capacity cards up to 32 gigabytes. Audio recordings don't take up much space. To give you an idea, a 32 gigabyte card could record up to 50 hours of high quality audio. So a 2 gigabyte card is normally going to be enough. Just be aware though that the maximum file size of any recording on the Zoom is 2 gigabytes. This doesn't mean that you can't record continuously. It just means that if you go over 2 gigabytes, more than one file is going to be created. You turn the zoom on by flicking this power switch here, down, like that. The screen turns on, as you can see, and you can check the battery life by looking at this icon here on the top of the screen. So let's talk about all the icons on the screen. At the top here, you've got all of these numbers, which are a time indicator telling you how long each clip has been recorded for. Next to that, you've got the auto gain icon, which is telling you that the zoom is setting your audio levels automatically. I'll tell you how to change that so that you can set the audio levels yourself a bit later on in the video. Auto gain is one of the default settings we recommend in our reset guide for the zoom, which can be found on our website. They're designed to be printed out and put in the bag along with the device. Down below the numbers, you've got the recording mode status, which tells you which of the four recording modes you're currently in. At the moment, we're in surround, um, which is also a default setting that we recommend in our reset guide. Next to this, you've got the side level adjustment, which is available in all of the modes apart from XY recording mode. Now, I'm going to talk about the information that these two icons represent a little bit more later on in the video. Let's move on down the screen. Here you've got your audio meters, which show you the volume at which your sound has been recorded. Now there are two bars here, and that's because the Zoom is recording two channels of audio. Now think of these two channels as being for your two ears, one for the left and one for the right, hence the L and the R that you can see here. In most of the record modes on the Zoom, you're going to get two channels of audio. There is one record mode, though, that has four channels, in which case you're going to see four bars here on the screen. Below the meter here, you can see all of these numbers. Now, these are your decibels. Zero is basically the ceiling, and what you're aiming for is between minus 12 and minus 3. At the end of the meter, you can see you've got two boxes here for each channel. Now, these boxes are normally going to be empty of colour. They turn black when the bars have hit the top of the meter, and they're basically a warning that your audio is too loud and may have clipped or distorted. Down here at the bottom of the screen, you can see these numbers. Um, this is the record format. At the moment, it's set to 4824, which is 48 kilohertz and 24 bits. That's basically the quality of the audio you're recording. 4824 is a good high quality setting that's suitable for video. Finally, you've got this section here. Now, you can see this SD icon. That means that you've got an SD card inserted. And the numbers next to it mean the amount of time you've got left to record onto the card. If I was to remove the card, all of that would change. So I've taken it out now. And you can see the SD icon has turned to an M, which stands for memory. That means you're going to be recording onto the internal memory of the device, which is only going to give you one minute of record time. That's very limiting, so we'd always recommend that you use an SD card. I'll put it back in now. So that's all you're normally going to see on the screen when you turn it on in record mode. Let's look at the body of the zoom now. Just here below the screen, you've got the record button, which you can tell by this big red dot here. When you press that and you're recording, a red light is going to come on here. Moving to the side of the device now, here you've got the menu button, which is used to access the menu. Below that you've got the play button, which you press to play back your clips. 
And this is also a jog wheel, which is used to navigate the menu and select. I'll just show you how that's done by going into the menu. There you go. Now I'm going to navigate up and down with the jog wheel. And I'm going to select by pressing in. I'll just do that to the camera so you can see how the jog wheel works. You can press up and down and press in to select. Now if you want to go back, what you do is you press the menu button and you press it once quickly and that's going to take you back to the previous screen. If you want to go straight back to your home screen, you have to press and hold the menu button and that will take you back in one step. Next you've got the mic gain dial, which is where you adjust your audio levels if you're recording in manual. Turning it down to zero means you're going to get no sound and 10 is obviously the loudest setting. Below that you've got the power switch, which I've already mentioned. It does have another function though. If you slide it up into hold, you're basically locking all the buttons on the zoom. Now this is really useful if you've got it in your pocket or something like that, because it means you're not going to accidentally knock any of the buttons and ruin your recording. Moving over to the other side of the unit now. This is where you plug in your microphone. Now the H2N only has this one 3.5mm microphone input, which is a limitation. It means out of all the microphones that CADAM provides, it'll only work with the video mic and the lavalier. You could plug in the NTG2, but you'd need an XLR to mini jack converter. You'd also need to put a battery into the microphone because the zoom does not supply phantom power. Below this mini jack, you've got your volume. Now this controls the volume of the zoom's output, which has nothing to do with the level of the audio that you're actually recording. It's what you're hearing either through your headphones or through this inbuilt speaker here above the screen. I would recommend that you leave this volume at a constant level. If you keep changing it, you're not going to be able to monitor your audio levels very successfully. Next, you've got a little socket here for a remote control, which you have to purchase separately. Moving on down, you've got another 3.5mm socket, which is for plugging in your earphones. Finally, down here at the bottom, you've got this USB Mini B port, which is for connecting the Zoom up to your computer. This allows you to copy all of your files over to your computer. It also allows you to record directly onto the computer using your preferred audio recording software. You could also use this USB port to run the Zoom off the mains, but for that you'd need an AC adapter, which is not supplied. Moving on to the base of the device, apart from this SD card slot, you've also got a standard tripod mount, which allows you to attach the Zoom to any tripod or any Gorillapod. I recommend you do this if you're using the inbuilt microphones on the Zoom, because a tripod or a Gorillapod is going to help isolate the Zoom from any handling noises. Finally, up here at the top, what you've got is the record mode dial. Now this makes it really easy to select which of the inbuilt microphones you're going to use and how. As I've already mentioned, the five inbuilt microphones give us four different record modes for different scenarios. The five microphones fall into two basic types. First you've got the XY microphones at the front here, and then you've got the MS microphones at the back. There are also two surround sound modes, which record either two channels or four channels of audio. You can see them here. Now, these two modes engage both the XY and the MS microphones at the same time, giving you a 360 degree audio recording. So let's look at all of these record modes in a bit more detail. And I'm going to start with the XY mode. So let's turn the dial to point to XY. And as you can see, this uh, light has turned off and this one has stayed on because I'm only activating the XY microphones at the front here. This mode uses two different microphones pointing in different directions. You've got the right mic, which is pointing left, like that, and the left mic, which is pointing right. And there's a 90 degree space between them. This creates an overlapping polar pattern, which you can see from this diagram. This is going to give you a fuller stereo sound that's less spacey than a normal stereo recording would be. It's particularly useful if you're recording nearby sound sources, like an interview or a simple musical performance. Just one note though, do be careful to keep the device pointing in the right direction. The mics are on this side, so this is the way it should be pointing towards your sound source. On the other side of the zoom, you've got your three MS mics. Let's just turn the dial so it's pointing to them. MS stands for mid-side, and you can see from this diagram what that means. 
The mid microphone is a front-facing directional microphone for picking up your main source of sound, such as dialogue. The two side microphones are for picking up sound to the left and to the right, which add ambience to your recording. Now, this is a very versatile mode, and you can even change the range of your side microphones, which you do using the play wheel here, the play toggle. I'll just show you what happens when I start moving it up and down. There you can see a diagram comes up, and if I, if I move it down, the size of these polar patterns is decreasing, which means the range is decreasing. And if I was going to turn it up, it would get bigger. And if I went all the way to the top, I get to something called RAW. And RAW, what RAW does, is it separates the two channels so that you can actually decide on the mix when you're editing. Finally, you've got the two surround sound modes, which I've already talked about a little bit. Let's turn it back to the two channel setting now. As you can see, the two lights come on because I'm using the microphones on both sides. As I'm still using the MS microphones, I can still set the range of the side microphones as I did before, using the play toggle, like that. Now when it's in two channel mode, everything is combined into one file and recorded onto your SD card. If however you're in four channel mode, it's going to record two files and you have the freedom then to put those together and mix them as you wish in your editing. As you already know, the Zoom can also record from an external microphone. And I've got the lavalier here as an example. Now to record from just this microphone, you need to be in XY mode. So I'll turn to XY there. When I plug it in, a little message appears on the screen saying external in. And as you can see, there's also a new icon there. The other thing you have to do to use an external mic is make sure that plug-in power is turned on. And to do that, you need to go into the menus. So let's just check that it is turned on. Press the menu. Scroll down to oh, input. Then you need to scroll down to plug-in power, which is there. And it was turned off, so it's a good thing we checked. Let's just select on. There we go, now I'm going to hold the menu button to go back to my home screen. In this mode, with the external mic attached, the XY microphones are actually disabled. If you were to turn to two-channel or four-channel surround sound, however, what you'd be able to do is record from two sources, the external mic and the MS microphones at the back here. This is particularly useful if you're doing something like recording a presentation, where you've got one main speaker but you don't want to miss any comments from the audience. It is worth noting that if you were to turn to MS mode, you wouldn't be able to record from the external microphone at all. And a little message does appear on the screen to tell you that. So we've looked at the basic anatomy of the zoom, and we've looked at what normally appears on the screen, and we've also looked at the four recording modes that are available. Now you're finally ready to start recording. Let's just remove the lavalier and put it out of the way. Now to start recording, you press the record button here. When you do that, the red light appears and things change on the screen. First of all, you've got the record icon there, and then you've got the name of the file that you're creating. Above that, you've got the counters counting up, which is telling you how long you've been recording. And down here in the corner, the counter is counting down because you've got less and less time on your SD card. To stop recording, you press the record button again, and the screen returns to normal. To listen to your recordings, you need to use the play button here. What you do is you press it in and your clips are going to start playing, starting from the last one you recorded. So let's give that a go. Press it in. There, my clip has immediately started playing. I just pressed it again to pause it. And if I want to skip through my clips, I can do that with a toggle function on the play button. I'm skipping down now. Um, to play that clip that I've just selected, I press in again and it starts, it starts playing. Press in again to pause it. If you press the menu button while you're in playback mode, you're gonna to get to the playback menu. So let's just do that. There you go. Now, I'm not gonna cover this menu in any depth, but it is worth saying that you can adjust the speed and the pitch of your recording, um, which is very useful if you're doing something like transcribing an interview. You can also do some basic editing on your clips.
To get out of playback mode, all you need to do is press the menu button and hold it in and it's going to return you to your home screen or your recording screen. Now we're back to the home screen, let's talk about the main menu on the Zoom. I'm not going to go into it in very much detail, but there are two core things that I want to show you. Firstly, how to change the format of the audio file that you're recording, because there is quite a wide range. So let's press the menu button to get into the menu. And scroll down to record. Press in to select, and then press in again to select record format. We recommend that you record in WAV format because that's going to give you uncompressed audio. As I've already mentioned, 48 kilohertz at 24 bits is going to give you really great quality, but the file sizes are quite large. The Zoom also records in various flavors of MP3. Now those are smaller files, but it is compressed audio, so the quality isn't going to be as good. The other thing I want to show you is how to turn auto gain off. So let's get back to our home screen by holding in the menu button. Now I'm back and get back into the menu. Press it. And I want to scroll up to input. Press into select and scroll down to auto gain. Now you need to select off. And there you go, it's turned off. Let's get back to the home screen again. And you can see that the auto gain icon has disappeared from the corner here. Now you're in manual, which means you're in control of the Zoom's audio levels, which you can adjust using the mic gain dial here. Let's just give it a go. I'm in MS mode, which means the Zoom is going to pick up my voice, which is what I want. And I'm just going to try and adjust it. What I want to do is bring it up to beyond the minus 12 decibels. It's too low now. I'm turning it up. There you go, it's hitting. Yes, that's just about right. It's between minus 12 and minus three. And you want to be careful, of course, not to hit the top of the meter. Once you've turned auto gain off, there are two more things you can do to control your levels. And you have to go back to input in the menu to get to them. So let's just do that. I'm on input already, select it. The first is low cut. Now low cut is a filter similar to the one on the NTG2. It cuts out low frequency sounds such as wind noise. I'd recommend you keep that off. Below that you've got compressor limiter. Now the selections within this menu allow you to either compress or limit your sound. Compression makes sure that your audio stays within certain limits. So it boosts your quiet sounds and it lowers your loud sounds. This is particularly useful if you've got a sound with a very wide range, such as drums. A limiter makes sure that your sound stays under a certain threshold so that it doesn't distort. This is useful if you're recording something like a live concert, when the music might get particularly loud. I'll leave you to explore the rest of the menu by yourself. It's very intuitive, and if you use our reset guide, you can't go far wrong. So that's the Zoom audio recorder. Let's move on to our final item now, the Rode Podcaster. The Rode is a good, solid microphone designed for recording straight onto a computer. You do need audio recording software installed on your computer, but they all do come with this. As an alternative, you could download Audacity for free. So let's just get rid of the Zoom now. The Podcaster is perfect for things like voiceover for video, radio, or of course, podcasts. Despite the way it looks, it's not meant to be handheld. In fact, it's quite sensitive to handling noises. It needs to be mounted, which you do here at the base of the microphone. So I'm just going to get the mount. And I've got a stand here as well. This ring mount actually comes with the podcaster. And to attach it, you need to remove this ring. You put it on. It can be a little bit tricky to attach, but... You get there in the end. Tighten it up. Everything has to be nice and tight. Now, this is a very versatile mount because it can be attached to either a microphone stand or a light stand, thanks to this screw adapter here. I'm just going to put that in. Having a penny around does help if you want to tighten it um, or when you're getting it out. And go nice and tight. 
<clears throat> now I'm going to attach it to this table stand. It's um, a very useful thing to have around if you can get hold of one. Um, I'm just going to attach it. Oh, better to have the legs in to do that. There we go. Everything has to be nice and tight. Open out the legs. There we go. And that's, um, now that's going to work really well on your desk next to your computer. The Podcaster has a cardioid polar pattern, which means it picks up sound from the end and from the sides, as you can see from this diagram. However, to get the best results, you really need to speak into the end like this. Get as close as you can, um, and don't worry about the popping sound that some microphones pick up when you say T's and P's, because the Podcaster has an inbuilt pop filter. To attach the microphone to a computer, you need to get the USB cord that's supplied and plug it in here at the base of the microphone. Now that's another reason why the Podcaster needs to be mounted like this, because you can't stand it on its end. So I'll just get the USB cord, here it is. You get the fat end of the cord and you plug it in to the base, like so. Then obviously the other end goes into your computer. The microphone is bus powered, which means the computer is going to supply its power. And when you've plugged it in, what should happen is the light at the end here, it's a green light, comes on. Then you know the microphone is being powered. The only other thing I need to tell you about is this jack here. It's for attaching your headphones so that you can monitor your sound in real time. The dial on the side here is for changing the volume of what you're hearing. It has no effect at all on the volume or the level of the audio that you're recording. You can only control that through the software on your computer, which also controls the format of the file that you're recording. So that's all the core audio equipment offered by Cadon. It's a good range of mics and devices that will meet most, if not all, of your audio needs, from high quality on location sound recording to in office podcasting. Getting good quality audio is really important for the production of educational media. Indeed, it's essential for every type of media production. With this gear and a bit of practice, I'm sure you'll have no trouble achieving the high quality that you need. That's all from me. Thanks for watching and bye for now.